Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Doris Bergen, the Chancellor Rose and Ray Wolf Professor of Holocaust Studies here at the University of Toronto. And it's my tremendous pleasure to welcome all of you here today for this special event, the annual Wolf Lecture on the Holocaust, featuring Marika Brown, who'll be speaking to us on A Child Survivor Pieces Together Her Holocaust Past. I want to begin with some words of thanks. The first thanks go to the Wolf family. The late Rose Wolf, Chancellor Emerita of the University of Toronto, established the Wolf Chair that I now hold. And Elizabeth Wolf is here with us today. Elizabeth, I just want to say how deeply grateful I am for your support, your engagement, and your commitment in Jewish studies and Holocaust studies. I also want to say that it's especially exciting to be able to greet Elizabeth Wolf today because we are welcoming a new generation of wolves with the birth of Morgan Ari Schneer, Elizabeth's grandson, just a few weeks ago. So congratulations, Elizabeth Wolf and your whole family. We're so thrilled. I also want to give a special shout out to my predecessor as Wolf Chair, Michael Maris. Michael, if you're there in the audience, welcome. Huge thanks are due to the Ann Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies for its support of the Wolf Chair and of this program. Our acting director, Michael Rosenthal, also Anna Sternschus, Galina Weissman, Natasha Rakiki Fried, and especially Sebastian Buccioni for the help today. Thank you all so much. Warm thanks to Dr. Joanna Krongold, my colleague in Jewish Studies, who will give a closing comment and moderate the question and answer. And also thank you to Eli Brown, Marika Brown's son, for the expert work on the visuals. So great to have you here with us. And of course, huge thanks to you, Marika. Thank you for accepting our invitation and being with us today. I wanna add also word of appreciation to everyone in our audience, and especially the students who've taken time out from their final exam preparation, students in my Holocaust class. I know our exam begins right after this, but I promise you coming to this event is going to help you on the exam. So today's event is the fifth Wolf lecture since Rose Wolf died, and I thought about Rose Wolf a lot while planning this event. I wanted an event that would be personal and that would be connected to some of her personal commitments. Rose Wolf was very committed to children of the Holocaust. She worked finding homes for Jewish orphans who came to Canada after the war. She was also, of course, a social worker and a generous supporter of our School of Social Work here at the University of Toronto. Marika Brown, of course, is herself a child of the Holocaust and also a social worker. There's another connection too. For Rose Wolf, the Wolf Chair was intended to bring together academic scholarship, community outreach, and Holocaust education. And I hope at the end of our event today, you'll agree that it has bridged these three, you could say, communities of inquiry. So Marika Brown is one individual, and she'll talk to us about her own individual journey, distinctive and unique experiences. But her experiences also illuminate a number of major issues and questions in the study of the Holocaust. And I want to highlight just three of those. The first one I could articulate, I guess, as a basic question, when did the Holocaust end? The study of the aftermath of the Holocaust, of afterlife, raises so many issues around displacement, loss, survival, rebuilding. All of these can only be understood if we look at how they work in the context of individual lives. A second major issue in the field of Holocaust studies, which is right now, I think, the site of some of the most innovative research, is about age, stage of life. What difference does age make? What were the experiences 
of children, of elderly people. Some of the best research, especially on elderly people, is being done right here at the University of Toronto by my colleague Paula David in the School of Social Work. But children too, very, very important work. You know, we often hear the statistic quoted that one and a half million Jewish children were murdered in the Holocaust. But what about those children who lived? And of course, Marika Brown was one such child. We will also hear at least the reflection of some scholarship in this area because our moderator, Joanna Krongold, is an expert on children's literature of the Holocaust. The third big issue I want to just have you thinking about is the question of how to integrate personal histories into the scholarship. Of course, there's wide agreement that eyewitness accounts, survivor accounts are precious and ever more so with the passage of time. Yet I think often these accounts are just collected and set aside or perhaps mined for a particularly emotionally wrenching soundbite. I want us to think together today about how the deeply personal reflections and experiences of Marika Brown also have immense historical value, how they shed light and connect with huge issues about rescue, about resistance. By the way, today is the commemorative day of Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. I've realized that looking at the calendar. About survival, about differences and similarities between Western and Eastern Europe. So I'm going to introduce our guest quite briefly because you're going to hear about her from the expert that is, Marika Brown herself. I already told you that she was born in 1943 in Amsterdam, was on the program. But I realized that description is not quite accurate because the baby who was born to German Jewish parents who had fled Hitler's Germany for Amsterdam was given the name Ruth, Ruth Michaelis. Within weeks, her parents and her older brother had been rounded up and transported to the east to be killed. But the baby remained in the Netherlands. She became the child of a Dutch mother. And after the war, she was found by her uncle who brought her to New York to live with him and his wife. Marika Brown grew up, went to college, got married, had two sons, got three master's degrees, made a career in social work, and only in the 1980s did she begin the process that she's called Opening My Past. Since then, she's spoken many times in the Netherlands, to, at schools, at museums. She appeared on Dutch TV. She was featured in a documentary. She's also spoken to classes, university classes in the United States, including my class at the University of Notre Dame, but I believe this is her first appearance in Canada, even on the screen. I mean, formal appearance. So I want to ask all of you to join me in welcoming Marika Brown. Welcome to the University of Toronto. Thank you, Doris. Now, you told me, and we discussed it, that your recollections are not linear. They're not organized in a linear fashion. So I was thinking, how's the best place to start? And I thought perhaps we could start with this photograph, the fantastic photograph that we put on the poster for this event. It's also the photograph that I saw when I first met you um, at your granddaughter's naming ceremony. Can you tell us about the photograph? What are we looking at? Who is it? Where, when, and can you begin sort of from that point? Okay, well, I think, I mean, we don't know, but I think that um, I was probably about three when this picture was taken. Uh, we had moved to The Hague. I don't know exactly when we did. Um, and this is Pauline taking a walk with what turned out to be her eldest daughter. Um, and probably not too much. I mean, I think that I was uh, sent to the United States um, 
shortly thereafter. And it's taken in front of um, a customs house. It's part of the old medieval um, setting in The Hague. Now, what did you always you like say? <laughs> pardon me, pardon me. I was wondering if you always had the photograph. Did the photograph come with you um, when you went to the United States? Um, there were photographs of, the, and this was one of them. There's also a picture of me in my, um, an enlarged picture of me. That's the same picture as my um, passport, which I always had and still have. Um, there, okay, there was about a year between when my uncle um, found me and when I finally got to the United States. And during that year, they negotiated with all kinds of people. And um, what I didn't know when I first started this journey, but what was became clear to me after 1994 was there was there were two agencies that were kind of vying for the post-war um, reconciliation with, with parents. And uh, one of those was called OPK and um, was run by uh, Shanda Barsh, who was the husband of Hester. And would you like to hear about Hester now? I think and you should Eli, tell us about Hester and Pauline Hester? and how you came to be with Pauline. Okay, so um, in 1994, um, I, had, I had started the search for Pauline in 1987. And I went to the Netherlands after I'd received a response that said that her husband was still living, but that she herself had died in 1976. So I went with a friend and we did the tourist thing. But at that time, I became connected to my um, foster sister whom I remembered and with whom I had had some contact um, around, um, uh, she was three years younger than I, but I was in college and we had some contact, but then the contact stopped, but I had some documentation and that's how I found Pauline's husband. And um, so I knew about Lita and then in 1994, out of the clear blue, I get this letter from, um, a woman called Hesta, who, who said, I don't know if you want to hear this. And I wrote back, I do want to hear this. And then she wrote me and said, and it was a long letter. The first one was short letter, but the second one was like, it was a packet almost. So she introduced herself and said that she was a friend of Pauline's and that she and Pauline had worked as um, rescuers during the um, war and uh, that they had, um, and then she tells me this story that, um, and this is how the story goes, and it's in the second in the packet. She said, um, they did what they were supposed to do, which was they, they got me, they took me to the north of, of Holland, and I had heard that story, that they took me, that Pauline took me to the north of Holland, and that the family that was supposed to take me uh, wouldn't agree to give me back should the family survive the war, and that was a no-go. So they brought me back to Amsterdam and Hester said she was 
you know, they grew fond of me. And so on one weekend, they both went home to their moms. And each of them talked to their mom about, well, I think I'm going to take her in and call her my own for the war and foster her. And each of the moms agreed that that was a good idea. So they told each other this and they were kind of like, okay, now what do we do? Because you're telling me this story and I have the same story and what are we going to do? And so they decided to flip a coin. So they flipped a coin and Pauline won and Hester did not. And she said she was sad, but actually as things turned out, it's a good thing that Pauline won because Hester had to go underground into hiding in August. I was born in June and, um, and she met, but subsequently during the war, married Shandor Barge. And Shandor became the head of OPK. So that at some point, she would, he would have had to force his wife to give up this baby, which would have been totally untenable. That is an incredible story. And can you tell back one step? Do you know? how you got this three week old or three and a half week old baby. How did you get literally on the doorstep of those two young women who were connected with the resistance? Um, we don't really know. We, I mean, we did a lot of reconstructing timelines, but we have a lot of conflicting information and I'm not sure what the answer is. As I was reviewing today and yesterday, I really think that what happened is that people knew about their resistance, people, Jewish people knew. And I mean, they went into the community and um, took the, the German, the Nazis would come and do what were called razzias. And those were raids and they would come in the middle of the night and then they would haul people off. Um, Hester and Pauline got kind of a heads up and would know when some of these raids were going to take place. And so they would go to those houses during the day and ask if people wanted to give them their children. And if, if they had children they wanted to do that, they would leave with children in their hands and arms and, and, and take them and find them homes. So I think she, I, and my birth father was in the um, Jewish council and uh, because he was an optician. And uh, so he might have heard, she might have heard from somebody. They didn't live in the Jewish ghetto. They lived in the pipe. And um, so I think they came and somebody took the baby and brought it to the, and that, that wasn't unusual, that it was done more than just me. And remind me, is it the case that when Pauline took you, she won the coin toss and you became her child, she became your mother, she got a birth certificate for you, is that correct? Yes, yeah, she did. Uh-huh. And, and the birth certificate was in um, the new name. So that that's when I became Marika von Vostyk. And now, can you talk a bit about the process of your uncle finding you and your aunt? You mentioned that there was a gap and a year and that this was a really conflicted process. It was terrible because the people who were in charge of this um, didn't. <laughs> so we had on the one hand OPK and they believed that every child should be looked at individually. 
And then there were the Jews who had survived or the Jews who were part of um, HIAS, which still is around and is a refugee organization. And they said, we want our children back and we want them now. So they were politically at odds with each other. And um, they tried to negotiate having somebody take me on a ship and that fell apart. And it must have been horrible for Pauline where she was being a mom on one hand and yet knew that somebody was going to take her, take me from her. And so when your uncle and aunt came to get you, they brought you to New York. You grew up with them. But yeah. I recall you saying that your aunt died shortly thereafter. Can you yeah. talk a bit about your situation in that home, in that new home? Okay. Uh, so it was a horribly difficult adjustment. I think part of that you said in your introduction, it matters about what period of life we're in. And I got shifted shortly before my fourth birthday. So that probably was not a really good time to, and I, I, I don't, I was bonded. So it was horrible. And then I think about a half a year before my aunt died, and my aunt died when I was eight and a half. And um, the couple had been childless, which didn't help at all. And so they didn't really know what to do with a kid. They didn't know what to do. It was not good. And, um, and they were older. So, and they had just gone through this upheaval themselves where they had had to leave Germany. They were German Jews. And um, and I don't think really had processed that loss. And so um, it was difficult. They just didn't have a clue. And I can remember I had this rag doll, which was really important to me because it was came from Holland with me. And uh, it, it completely fell apart. Its name was Jansha, which is little John. And um, and well-meaning person that he was, he, my uncle sewed a new rag doll for me out of scraps that he, I don't know where he found them. But, and it was totally, and it really was a good replica, except that the, smell was wrong and the fabric was wrong and I was just <laughs> beside myself and, it, and he meant well and it was just off the mark and he wouldn't have known he would not have known you've described your experience of like opening your past as being like assembling a jigsaw puzzle and if you think about like this early stage of your life, when you were living with your uncle and your aunt in New York, it actually went, you could say for, well, 40 years until the 1980s where you began that process of opening. And I'm wondering in that period, if you could talk about why you kept in a way that door closed. I mean, was it that you yourself felt I can't, I can't return to that. It's too painful. Was it discouraged from outside? Were people in some way interested in something that you had experienced? I think, okay, well, it certainly was painful. It was very difficult for me to open up about it. Not that it wasn't open, but it was, it was very difficult for me to confront the loss that I felt. Um, and I guess I was a kid and 
I remember being sort of gotten rid of. And um, that was extremely painful. And I always thought it was because there was something wrong with me. And so it was impossible to sort of come out of that and sort of develop a more adult view. And um, the other thing is that as a, um, a teenager and later as a young adult, early, I would try to talk to people about what had happened and, and the loss, particularly about the loss. And my experience was that they didn't want to hear it. And for some, they didn't want to hear it. For some, who it rang too close to their own losses and they didn't want to open theirs up. And so nobody talked about this. And when we hit this wall, uh, even when, we, when I started opening this up, we could, my family called it the big silence because nobody would talk. And I mean, here's Hester sitting on all this stuff. Um, when I was at Hester's in 1994, one of the most striking things for me was she had this piano. And so I'm sitting in the settee facing this piano and on the top of the piano, are these photos of me age about six months, eight months, something like that. Young, but not baby pictures. And I'm looking at them and I have the same pictures. And I'm looking at them and I and she said, my family's always seen these pictures. They, they knew about me, but I never, but so she's sitting on this information. Why did she wait 50 years to tell me? Any idea of the answer to that question? Uh oh, I think we have a technical problem. Well, I mean, she said they grew apart. And you have to remember too, there's the language barrier. Now, Marika, can you tell us about the trip you started to talk about in 1987, where you went and you said, well, we did tourist things, but you made contact with your sister, your foster sister with Lita, yeah. and you've described her as almost like a bridge, a bridge connecting you. Can you talk about that trip and what you sort of what you knew, what you didn't know, what you learned at that time? Okay, so I'm, okay, that's a picture of me and Lita. So she was three years younger than I, so I was around when she was born. So I knew she was around, but the person that I went to see was um, Pauline's husband. And Pauline's husband was very strange with me because he sort of said, I don't know who you are and I don't know you, but I know of you. And later I found out that he never allowed her to talk about that period of time. And I also learned that he was not nice to her and that uh, she was, you know, really depressed most of her life. And when Lita shared that with Hester. Again, we have that sense of here's a little piece and then there's a piece and we stick the pieces together, but we don't know where they fit anywhere else. Um, Hester said her experience and my experience of Pauline was a different Pauline than Lita. So that too may enter into, I don't know. But um, so, when I was leaving the house, he was very polite, but he just wasn't going to talk about Pauline. And it lived to tell me he burned all her pictures when she died. So 
and she was an attractive, they tell me, uh, woman. And he, he just put her down all the time. And it was just really bad. So, but when he's, when I started to leave, he said to me, my daughter will not forgive me if I don't tell you that she's here and here's her phone number and here are some maps <laughs> and she lives up north. So I went and got a phone and this was before cell phones and um, before computers and, um, and ran her up and said, English. I didn't have any, and I just said, my, and, you know, she said, oh my God. And she said, come and visit. And I did. Um, and I expected to stay a day. I spent two days, which was all we could do. And um, as a result, I kind of opened up her own puzzle. So she's part of my puzzle, but she also has her own puzzle. And um, and that sort of blew her sky high. And so then she told me about her experience with Pauline, how her mom and dad were, with, and, and that made me terribly sad because she clearly had a very hard life. Tried to kill herself and subsequently died in 76 and it was just awful. But so there was somebody, so by the time Hester decided it was time to find out what was going on, there was somebody to contact and that was Lita. And Lita and I stayed in touch after I had met her, re-met her. And she had some of the same pictures I had. So we shared that and we talked about that. And did she remember any of that? Well, no, she was too young. And, um, but I remembered, and I remembered her. Now the encounter with Hester turned out to be extremely important for you, um, but also isn't there another piece that comes through Hester's son, Carl? Um, yes. And there, I thought it would be interesting if you could tell us about some of the work that you did with Carl and his own sort of Holocaust education initiatives inside the Netherlands, because that becomes an important piece for later. Right. That's a lovely picture. Hester had this wonderful garden and she had a little guest cottage in the garden. And when we met her in 1994, she we, the whole family came with me, and so there were lots of people around, and we talked, but then she banished everybody. She was quite <laughs> a person, and uh, she banished everybody out, so everybody was there, but then she said everybody was to go, and then Lita and I were to spend the night uh, together in this little guest cottage, which we did and get, you know, bond some more and get to know each other better. It was a very sweet thing for her to do. So now, the way that, now, the language thing. So Hester really didn't speak much. I mean, she spoke a little bit of English, but she wasn't very comfortable speaking it. And so when she started to look for me, she in, asked her son, Carl, to help her. And he's the one who wrote the letters. And so I met him at her house and um, we stayed in touch. And, the, and he was extremely helpful um, because in that year, in that visit, we not only met Hester, but um, we also applied for Righteous Among Nations for Pauline. And we did that while we were in Holland. And so we met with somebody from the Israeli consulate and, um, and Carl was helpful with that as well. And she received so that, in that designation. Picture, you see Carl. 
she did, it was really cute. They said to me, now it's got to go through, I mean, this by mail. But um, <laughs> there were a lot of people coming out of Eastern Europe right now. So it'll be a little longer than usual. <laughs> And uh, and right on target. And I went back to Holland for the uh, ceremony to you know inaugurate and initiate whatever. And both the sisters came, so uh, it was nice. It was very nice. Uh, yeah, she got the designation. But that was part of the story that Hester had been around. Um, <laughs> Pauline's husband wouldn't let her become, even if. There wasn't any, even if there was somebody to come forward, because she had rescued children too, but he, he wouldn't let her do it, wouldn't let her be recognized. It was really sad. Yeah, you wonder if that's about a kind of like jealousy or about, yeah. No idea. I, I think he was, he was in... I really, I don't remember this. I, I, I think he was in, he was in a camp in, I don't know if it was in um, Indonesia. He was in Indonesia during the war in a camp. And I, my understanding is those were brutal, horrible places. And um, I think he didn't want any he immigrated to the Netherlands, and I don't think he ever wanted to look back. And I mean, he didn't it's want her looking back. It's what you said before, right? About how sometimes you trying to open up your past got other people more committed to keeping their own past in some way, in some way closed. I'm looking at this picture of presenting the documentation, and of course, I see your son, Seth Brown whom I know, I see, I think, Maria and you. Can you talk a bit about your own children, your relationship with your own children, and then going with both of them? You mentioned this second trip in 1994. It included yeah. uh, both your sons, Seth's partner, Maria. Can you yeah. talk about your own family? Yeah, I can talk about my own family. They were... I'm sorry about the noise. Um, they um, they were available to come with me. And 1994, they both came. Maria, who was already with Seth and continues to be with Seth, um, came. So that was wonderful. So they were there at the beginning. And Eli, who was doing the visuals for us, um, probably behind the camera in that one, um, went, I, oh, I counted this time. I w went to the Netherlands 16 times over 16 years, over more than 16 years, but basically every year. And uh, for most of those, Eli came for part of it, came for all of it. So he really was with me a lot of the time. And you want me to talk about Carl? In two thousand, two, okay. In two thousand, Hester passed away. In two thousand and one, Carl started these. It started very small, 15, 20 minutes of a little story to present to school children where we could um, talk about racism and discrimination. That was the point of the thing. That grew into like Topsy um, so that by the time I stopped doing it, in 2011, it, the story had morphed into an hour and a half thing. And, um, and the times were different. So um, we he would present this wonderful presentation. 
and story about his family, about Hester and the, and the, the part about me. And then afterwards we would engage the kids who were middle school and high school age and talk about their experience with discrimination. And most of the kids were um, Muslim, a lot of them were Suriname. So um, we, we had kids who came from Turkey. I mean, these were the immigrants in the Netherlands and they had very much experienced discrimination. So we talked about how that felt, what, what else one could do besides kill each other um, and how to stop the bullying and stuff like that. So that leads really well into um, the question about your appearance on Dutch TV. But I want to first um, fill in something in between because when I first met you in South Bend, Indiana, um, it was in the 1990s. We could figure it out exactly. If you remind me, how old is your granddaughter, Paula? Paula's 18, she's gonna be 19 next month. Exactly, so this is 19 years ago because of course she had just been born and there was the ceremony about her naming and her name Paula, of course, is a tribute to, to Pauline. And you right. spoke in my class at that time and you had put together a family tree of your birth family, right? And right. information, sort of the pieces of the puzzle that you had assembled by that point, in some way, at least from my perspective, they seemed like almost a fairly coherent picture. Some gaps, you know, that you didn't know how you got to Pauline and Hester and so on. But then it really, in a way, that picture was kind of opened up again by the experience in 2003 when you went on Dutch TV. And I wonder, can you tell us about that and the kind of next level of discovery? Yeah, I mean, it really blew my whole world apart to the degree that even though I didn't recognize it, I came home with, um, well, I was in shock. And they talked to me about seeing somebody and, but I didn't know what happened. Um, so um, the documentary was sort of a 20 minute bit and, um, but it was out there and they took two weeks to, to make it. They filmed in New York and then they filmed in Amsterdam and they presented sort of what you said was the, the, this picture. Well, it was out there and um, we were doing presentations the, the third week and it was a Wednesday. Was it Tuesday? Anyway, there was a phone call to the Frizzettes Museum from the, produce, um, the, the gal who was Carl's ex-wife who had produced the, this is Elska and she was on the phone with me and she said, are you sitting down? I said, yes. And she said, there's a woman who claims she knew your brother and um, what do you think we should do? I said, I think we should go see her. And tomorrow, uh, yeah, this was Tuesday. Wednesday, I had half a day and I said, as soon as I'm done here, we can go. And, um, and we did, and she, we drove to Osmer, which is where Annika lives. And, um, and I, I walked in and, and what met this very warm, lovely person who, um, said, I mean, she took the flowers from me and put them in a vase. And then she said, I think your brother, you know, was like my best friend and he was a real pal. And um, 
I can remember when they left. Nothing bad happened to me during the war, she said, except this one thing, which was my best friend. And I saw them being escorted. She lived directly across the street from us. And she said she was so escorted away. And then they came back. And my brother came to her and she called him BB because that's what he went by, which I didn't know. He gave her a book on a biker. He gave her um, a box of magic tricks. So this was a nine year old boy. And this box of magic lantern slides. And she said, I, the magic tricks went fast. My children probably played with them and got rid of them, whatever. But I'm sure I had the book, but I can't find it. And now you're here. And so, but I have the magic lantern slides. And so she hands me these things. And um, uh, and she said he asked me to hold on to them until they he came back, and he never came back. But I always hoped, she said, that he would come back. And um, then she had pictures of him in school, and. So I shared with others um, what had happened and learned about a magic lantern, which I had no idea what, there's my brother in, in his school class. And, um, and then um, one of, I don't remember who it was, whether it was Carl or Elska or somebody else, connected with somebody who was nearby who had a magic lantern collection. And then both families, the families on Linda's side and the families on Hester's side, chipped in and bought a small magic lantern. And the gentleman could only fit in a certain number of people. So we had this magic lantern show uh, that was the day before I left to come back to the United States. And we were, there's this magic, it was lovely. It was, it was just lovely. And he had fancy magic lanterns, so he could really get the best out of the slides. And But it was a piece of my family. I had really, up until I met Annika, no real sense of that part of the family. Brother, didn't know my mother, didn't know my father. And the magic lantern slides were a window into my father because at the, my brother had a birthday party in April of that year. Now they had sold everything they owned just to make ends meet and have food. Um, and, but they did put on a little party in the back room and Annika, of course, being the best buddy, uh, went to it and she said they had some sweets and they, my father showed these magic lantern slides and what you do is you show the slide and then you provide the narration so that you know it's, it's this cute story or whatever so that's a whole side of you know a, a family I had no contact with and didn't know anything about well and I'm thinking as you're telling that the contrast between the way that you presented your family when you spoke to my class they were names on a family tree, right? They were names. And even the names you could say was sort of, yeah, precious knowledge in some way. But then suddenly the name, like knowing that your brother's name, okay, his name was Kurt, but they called him Bibi. 
knowing that your father was not only an optician, but someone able, and it's interesting to think of the optician and the magic lantern slides, right. someone able to mount a program like that in the midst of like spring 1943. This is the depths of the Holocaust, right? The terrible, difficult times. And yet able to, yeah, make a party for your brother to make something special. It's a very sweet memory. And she had um, another memory. They used to be in class together. So they were the same age and same class. But then with the rules, he was no longer able to go to school with her. He had to go to a Jewish school, right? And so he would come and pick her up on a scooter because uh, I'm sure the bikes were all being used for something else. Um, so you didn't have a bike, but you, he had a scooter and he would come on the scooter and pick her up and walk her home. So it's, it's just a piece of life that they didn't have before that for me. And can you talk a bit more then about when you came back, like you said, you returned home. And again, I remember I saw you at that time, right? And you said, I was in shock. Like it blew my world wide open. You know, right. can you talk a bit about sort of, yeah, what did you do with that knowledge? I don't know. I mean, I continued my relationship with Annika and we're still friends to this day. And and she'll be watching and um, and we still talk about it, but we also have a 20 year relationship, you know. Um, so, and I've gone to see her and visit her as, pretty much every time I've gone since then, when I've gone to the Netherlands. Um, I, I continued to go. There was more to know. Um, after this happened in 2006, seven, six, um, Carl took me to Westerbork. And at that time, Westerbork wasn't real big deal. It, it, the, the camp was gone, but they had a model of the camp in the visitor center. But what they had was archives in the back. So I asked about that and they let me come in and they printed out for me a listing of who was deported at the same time as my family. And they had that all. And they had the, their case number and with that, and they encouraged me to, to, to uh, contact the Red Cross, the International Red Cross. And so I uh, did. And by then, we're talking email. So I emailed, and they said, oh, it was going to take six weeks. It took, you know, five days or something. It, they had the number. They could pick it all up. So as a result, I found out which barracks they were in at Westerbork and when they officially died and so forth. But I, it really, it told us, it gave us more timeline information. There's another really important kind of, I guess, chapter in the journey or in the like assembling of that puzzle, almost like reassembling now with all of this new information. Um, that we talked about earlier that I think it would be so interesting for people to hear more about. And that's, I guess by now it's your most recent trip, right? Back to the Netherlands. In uh, it's not the most recent, it's the one before that. The most recent I went and helped uh, open um, a, a bridge. It's just a little thing. <laughs> well, it's barely a bridge in a, a park. Uh, that was getting renamed for Hester. So uh, I went to the ceremony for that. And it was very nice, but that was, that was 2016. And for me, the 30 years of 
finding the pieces and putting them together. And, you know, I, I still think there's probably more information I don't have that I may never have. But people may still come out of the woodwork because people did. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't unusual. Um, saying, you know, we have this. And, and things just happen like that. So, you know, yeah, 2014 was the end for me. It was what I had really, if I were to think about it carefully, wanted all of this time, wanted all my life. Um, yeah, um, it was very healing. Um, we went back. I had been to The Hague quite a number of times. Um, and even in 87, when I went, we stayed at the beach area that's adjacent to The Hague. And I'll mispronounce it, but it's something like Skeffingen. And it's a beautiful little area. But when we went in 2014, it, it, it was cold. <laughs> And then the beach houses weren't out and the beach was empty. But we went and we had some cocoa and Carl was driving us around. Eli was with me, Eli's wife. And, um, and Carl said, do you want to stop at the house that you left? Do you remember the address? And of course, I did remember the address. I've always, it's like burned in my head. And um, so I did remember the address. And so we drove by and I had seen it before, but there the houses were sort of connected and, you, and there was no way to get to the back so you could look at it maybe from the back. So um, Carl being Carl, he, um, he went and knocked on the door and a gentleman answered the door and Carl convinced him that he should let us come in, except we were not allowed to take any pictures <laughs> inside the house. I don't know why, but he did. And so, with some trepidation, I crossed the threshold. And, they, and he, he was very nice and he wanted to show me his house. So he wanted to take me through the downstairs up those, and he had very Dutch stairs and stairs that I sort of have some memory of having difficulty with, which would make sense because Dutch stairs are difficult. They're steep. They're curved, they're difficult. And I was a tiny little kid. So, um, and I went up and there's a second floor, I, I didn't stop. And then we went up to the top floor. And the minute that I got there, I knew I was home. I, it, it was right, I knew where things were. I knew with what things were. I went to the balcony, which I had a memory of. I must have liked it very much. And the outside looked different, but it was the same balcony. And I was sobbing and, but I was, I could almost see her holding her hand. It was unbelievable. It's so powerful to think about the image of the house, the home, the space, and the association with Pauline. And I remember when we were first talking about this event, and I had asked you, you know, how did you find, I don't know, the strength or the knowledge to just 
continue your life, to raise your children, to make a warm, loving home, you know, for them. And you said to me, I always knew that I was loved by Pauline. I always felt, you know, that I had that love as a child. Um, and it's so like to think about maybe the house somehow holding that, you know what I mean for you? Like, yes. Holding that. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it was, but you know, that was my memory of home. And I could pick, you know, there was this room before you had to go through to get to the balcony. And I, that's where we had the playpen for Linda. I just remember it. It was just, that was there. And like that space in a way, just sparking the return to that, to that memory. Yeah, now, and to the feeling. Yeah, to the feeling. Of being loved. Yeah. And, you know, this is another thing, too, that we talked about, and maybe that's a good kind of way to end, is, I hope it's not too personal, but um, we had talked early on that when you first spoke to my class, and it was one of the first, I think, presentations you've given in the United States versus the many presentations you've given in the Netherlands and different kinds of questions and responses and so on. And I remember that one student had put up their hand and asked like, you know, Mrs. Brown, you lost your mother twice. You know, what happened when you were taken away from Pauline and brought, you know, to the United States? And you had looked out at the classroom and said, you know, well, it ruined my life. Um, and then I had said to you, well, yes, but your life continued. And you made so much, you know, with the career and working with other people and helping other people and your own children. Um, but then when you told about finding home, you said, you know, I really have, yeah, come to feel such gratitude. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about like that kind of almost like new stage or shift in your own thinking about your life. Well, I don't think the two are mutually exclusive, to tell you the truth. I think what I meant by that, I mean, and it's a very feeling kind of statement, you know, it didn't, in a way, it did ruin my life. That doesn't mean you can't, out of the ashes, have another life that um, is very good and for which I am very, very grateful I don't think they're mutually, I talked to Seth about this, you know, they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, what, would I have rather stayed with my birth family? You know, you can't play those games. I mean, when I was doing the video, the person who interviewed me would ask me about, you know, if, uh, if this hadn't happened, you can't play those games. This is the way it came down. And it certainly destroyed the path that was supposed to happen, which was to live with my birth family. It then destroyed living with the one woman who I bonded with as a mother. Those things, those lives were destroyed. Um, and I, of course, yearned for that that closeness, that bond, that love. But that doesn't mean that you can't have love again and that you can't have a good life. It's just not that one. And it wasn't. Maybe that is a really good note to end on. That sort of yeah, profound point that, you know, they're not mutually exclusive, that, you know, Life goes on even as it's ended and those two things are entangled. So I wanna say thank you so much for answering all my questions and also Eli for those fantastic visuals. The images are incredible. And now I'm gonna turn the floor over to Joanna Kronengold for comments and response. And then if you're willing to take questions from our sure. audience, um, I certain there'll be many of them. So Joanna, it's over to you. Hello everyone. And thank you so much, Doris and Marika for that incredible and very moving conversation um, about your life story and your life experiences. 
as a child trying to piece together your Holocaust past. Um, once again, I'd like to invite um, our listeners and our audience members to submit questions for Marika if you have them. Um, especially if we have any students in the audience, we'd like to invite you to, um, to pose a question for Marika. And um, I thought I would sort of begin because I was struck by so many things in your conversation, but one of the things that really stood out to me is the way that you described this journey to discover your past as putting together a kind of jigsaw puzzle. Um, and there are so many aspects of your life that still have these sort of gaps and silences and, you know, only came to you in fragments and maybe you discovered one avenue, but then the door was shut. So you sort of went another way and discovered something else um, or, you know, confronted big silences, not only in your own family, but in the memory of people that you were reconnecting with. Um, and it, it, it made me think of something that Doris said at the very beginning of this talk, which is that, you know, your recollections aren't linear. And I think it's so interesting to think about the idea of how those recollections get pieced together when we're sitting here looking at all of these amazing collections. So through these collections of photographs and objects and material things, you're kind of able to recollect and to also recollect all of these memories and these things that link you to your past. Um, and that struck me as something really fascinating because here you have assembled this amazing archive of materials and photographs that um, put together some of that jigsaw puzzle and, and kind of show the importance of, of, of your individual story and its relation to the wider history of the Holocaust. Um, and what really struck me is when you were talking about those magic lanterns um, that you discovered, you said, you said that the way that you look at it is you put them into the slide and then you provide the narration. And I think that's just a perfectly fitting metaphor for what you've done for us today is that you've given us these slides and these pieces of the puzzle and you really provided the narration that allows us insights into this really moving and incredible story. So I wanna thank you for that. Um, and I can see that everybody is submitting their profound appreciation for your sharing your story with us today. And I'm gonna pass it back over to Doris. And I'm just gonna say thank you so much, Joanna. And thank you so, so much, Marika. And again, a special shout out to Eli because the visuals were really important too, but it was just fantastic to have you here with us. And so just enlightening and profound and moving and can I say honest? So thank you, thank you so much. I wanna say thank you also for having me. I really appreciate the forum to have a chance to, to tell my story because I think it's important. I think it's really important these days. So, so many you. people, when I talked about the event, they said exactly that. They're like, we need to think and to listen more than ever to stories like this. So thank you, Marika Brown. Thank you all of you for being here with us. And yeah, until the next time. Thank you.